And together today, we're going to tell you about our approach to measuring the productivity of the uh, software development process. So um, let me first uh, start by clarifying what we mean by that. Um, oh, this place. All right, anyway. um, so uh, like any process, uh, the uh, uh, software development uh, process just takes inputs and transforms them into outputs. And what we want is just to measure and quantify those inputs and outputs. And uh, the motivation behind it is simply that if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. Uh, in the case of uh, writing code, so software development, developers supply time. And the outputs are the uh, quantity and quality of the source code that they write. And uh, these are the three dimensions that we're going to uh, talk about today. And uh, Albert is going to kick it off by uh, addressing the uh, time question. Yeah. So um, basically, if you want to understand more about code production, then uh, the time dimension is, well, the, the most basic thing you might want to uh, tackle. And the question is uh, pretty simple. So. Um, you want to analyze code change uh, at the most reasonable atomic level, um, which is probably that of a single commit, so a change of code checked into some version control system. And uh, the idea is that you've got a commit um, there. I mean, for open source projects, um, they're public, so um, there's lots of data to train on. You've got a commit at, say, 9 o'clock, and then you've got another commit at 11 o'clock. And uh, so, so you guess there's maybe two hours of programming work um, going on between them. But I mean, if you guess, then you'd probably be wrong. In fact, it's hard to get reliable numbers, but um, there's a very broad consensus that software developers only spend a tiny fraction of their time actually banging out code. I mean, first of all, most of their time is spent not actually working. If they are working, they are spending their time on different roles, um, not software development roles, but maybe supervising, marketing, talking to HR, whatever. If they are doing software development work, they're often not programming, they're planning, they're demoing, um, they're gathering requirements. Those are all important things to do. But they are hard to attribute to a single code change. So um, what we are interested in is simply the pure act of coding. How long does that take? And as with many, of, well, many problems of that kind, there's basically two roads to go down um, how to actually find that out. One is the road of extreme surveillance, which is, well, frankly, a lot of effort. Uh, it's error prone and it's prohibitively invasive. Don't want to do that. The other approach um, that we'll, we'll take um, is to use only the publicly available data, which is the timestamps of the commits, have a lot of them, and from there infer some general conclusions. So what do we do? Um, uh, basically, our, our model is that between two commits, some part of the time is spent coding, some is not spent coding. Um, disregard for a second uh, this, uh, the, the stuff in the upper left corner. Um, that kind of screams um, for a hidden Markov model, which um, models um, every developer as basically a Markov process that bounces around between those two states with fixed probabilities. However, um, a simple Markov model it doesn't go far enough because the chance to start coding at some uh, time point, well, it's pretty low on a Friday night. It's hopefully much higher on a Monday morning. So um, what we're going to, do, to use as a model is um, a two-tiered approach. On the lower level, we've got a hidden Markov model, well, our hidden Markov-like mo model with parameters that depend on time, and they are fed um, by parsing the time, pa passing the time through a neural network. And that neural network isn't supposed to do anything very fancy. So it's deliberately simple. It's a um, one hidden layer of, I think, 10. And all it should do is um, get some basic uh, schedule information that's, that's learned about that programmer. So um, we pass date time in, but in order to, to allow the neural net to pick up um, sensible rhythms, um, what we actually do is pass the Fourier transform in um, so um, to get uh, the weekly and daily rhythms right. Yeah, so um, I mean, uh, first of all, um, we can 
maybe I should say that first. First of all, um, we can use that to annotate um, each commit by a guess for um, how much time was spent on that. And in individual cases, that will be um, wrong, but on general, it, it, it should be good. <coughs> However, kind of on the side, um, we also learn much more about the software development process. So for example, um, you can look at the um, well, focus profile for uh, software de developers. Um, so in this case, I've just plotted um, the model predictions for how likely the software developer is to start a new block of coding on the y-axis. And uh, the color dim dimension says how long a block of coding will they uh, start. So this is a typical pr uh, profile for a commercial developer. They mostly are focused um, within working hours. Outside, there's a very low chance of doing any coding, coding work. And, um, well, in the morning, they have, they're, they're fo very, very highly focused. They start a few long coding blocks, while during the afternoon that deteriorates a bit. There's more interruptions. Um, they often start a new coding block, but it's generally shorter. Uh, contrast that to a typical, oh, well, I don't know whether typical, but because there's no, there's, there's many different types. But contrast that to some uh, profiles from a, um, from a non-commercial developer. So um, if my mouse works, which it doesn't. Sorry? Page down. Yeah, um, yeah, page down works, excellent. Um, so this is um, a non-commercial developer, um, an academic uh, from North America. And um, so you see that during the day, uh, this part here, they've got a good and relatively constant chance to start some coding blocks. However, they're not usually very long. And that makes sense. I mean, during the day, um, he has to deal with interruptions from students, from colleagues. Uh, maybe stuff is going down at the lab. Uh, I've got no idea. In the evening, they also sometimes work. And there, they're less interrupted. It's, it's a bit greener. However, this particular individual, um, and I don't know why, maybe they've got insomnia. Maybe they just found that's the only place of this, I think, where, where they can. Um, at around 2 o'clock or so, they get up and they really bang out a lot of code and, yeah, at that time there's no interruption at all. Sorry? I mean, it's like it's coding. So, so, sorry? When does he sleep? I <laughs> do not know. I, I mean, that's what lectures are for, probably. Um, Chris, so, Will? This, this data that you're reporting here, how yeah. did you collect it? Is this survey, self survey data, or is this invasive instrumentation of their <laughs> uh, No, uh, this, is, um, this is model uh, inference um, from the GitHub data. So um, I've, I've analyzed um, every uh, halfway prolific uh, contributor to um, uh, GitHub uh, Python projects, and uh, picked a few test authors at random, which, which I've um, looked at in more detail. I mean, in this particular case, there's um, a justified question of whether the model, um, whether the, the, those predictions actually can be true. And um, especially here, at first I thought the model had gone off, something's wrong with the neural net or something, and uh, I extensively sanity checked uh, this particular case to see whether the, the, the commit types make sense and so on. It does. In general, of course, um, there's a lot more validation than sanity checking going on, and I don't have real time. No photo first, but <laughs> I want to flick through the sl slides quite quickly. I basically just put them there that you can look at uh, on, on uh, in the slide deck um, and to convince you that while I do not have the very invasive surveillance data, I at least tried to, um, yeah, to test some of the assumptions of the model. Probably the most important test, however, is um, whether it actually um, gives us some useful uh, results. To, be, um, to understand commits and code changes. In particular for the following, um, which was the actual reason why I even embarked on coding time, what we wanted to find out is how substantial a piece of programming is. And that's actually quite an old question in uh, software analytics. How big is a piece of code? And I mean, there's, there's a very general consensus that just counting lines of code, that's, that's overly simplistic and doesn't work, but of course, it's, 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 it's still what's done. And um, yeah, we wanted to come up with an um, empirical alternative to that. 
And the approach that um, we suggest uh, was that, um, well, we want to measure size in the time that's usually taken to, uh, to, to program that. So measure the, so the size of uh, uh, the, the, measure the output of one code change as the time that it would you, uh, take a typical standard coder from GitHub or somewhere to come up with that code change. So um, we predict um, from the source code change the coding time and then take that prediction as our definition of output. Uh, however, that relationship between source code change and coding time, that is extremely noisy and inherently so. Just because the same source code change, I mean, say you're just changing one smaller than to a bigger than. Well, uh, that could be a trivial change that takes one minute to come up with and, uh, and com commit. Or it could be the result of an extensive bug search that took you hours. So those are actually distributions. And what we want to predict are looking at the source code change, basically cluster that into different kinds of source code changes, some of which have a distribution that's more geared towards the low time end, and those we call easy, and some whose distributions are more geared towards the high time end, and those we call well, more substantial. And um, so um, a good way to, to deal with that is um, using uh, density networks, in particular mixture density networks that do not pre try to predict the coding time, but predict parameters of a mixture distribution. And those networks are then trained with a likelihood loss. And apart from that, they're uh, completely uh, vanilla um, neural networks. They're slight, uh, or the ones that we've got good experience with are slightly deepish, but not too crazy. And this basically allows us to um, sort coding changes into so, uh, some which are relatively fast. So um, on average, don't know how, how well that's legible, a bit more than a quarter of an hour, all the way to uh, three quarters of an hour, which is, I think, a, quite an amazing uh, spread, uh, considering that the variance of these distributions is inherently high. Now, um, what can we do with that? Um, well, we are much better equipped to understand code changes, and we've only just begun to um, query that model. But the first thing that I was interested in, because I'm personally interested in uh, human lo logic reasoning, is the following. We know that humans find it very difficult to reason about negations. For computers, it isn't that difficult. I mean, negation, that's a different truth value, but that's it. However, um, humans have to like, keep one more layer of abstraction in their head, and it confuses them. And it should mean that they take a bit longer to code that. And um, the, the question is, is that picked up by this coding output model? And um, yes, it is. So um, there's different ways to see that, but um, maybe the most straightforward is look at um, a random code diff that, that you find on GitHub. So um, that contains um, maybe the word false. So the coding output model will say, well, this took some time. I don't know. This is a made up number. Um, have run it on that one. Then you can make up a different source code change and ask yourself, what instead of, if instead of um, having to reason about something that's false, the developer had been allowed to reason about something that's true, how long would that have taken? And you ask the coding output model. And um, well, in, in this case, it's, 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 it's uh, lower, but, but you can check that for um, every, um, everything you find on GitHub. And then you find out, well, yes, it is faster to reason about truth than about falsehood by about five seconds. And um, you get the same if you swap um, equality versus inequality. Again, it's something that takes the same amount of time to well, type if, if, if someone dictates it to you. It's the same amount of characters. Um, well, in fact, false has one more character. <clears throat> Anyways. Um, yeah, but um, it's obviously more difficult to reason about. It doesn't quite work with plus versus minus. Um, however, I mean, this is the Python corpus, so plus only also stands for concatenation, and who knows what's going on there. So it's a special case, which um, I'm okay with. 
Yeah, um, however, um, that, 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 that's, that's just the time, but the most important thing is the quality of the code, because well, with the true, true instead of false, obviously, it might be bad code. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so that was about measuring the uh, quantity of the input consume and uh, output produced, and uh, now indeed I'm, I'm going to focus about the third dimension, which is uh, how can we estimate the uh, quality of the output produced? So uh, how could we try to have a stab at answering the question, how, how good is this piece of code? Well, if you want to have a go at it, um, you need to have two things. Uh, so you need to have uh, measurements that you believe are related to the uh, quality of the source code, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, you need a way to put them in context. Because in itself, a measurement is not necessarily very informative. Uh, if I give you a value, if you don't have context to put it in perspective, uh, well, you don't actually, uh, it's this perspective that actually gives you the information about the uh, property of the uh, thing being measured. So it's important to have that. Um, so what's our data set? Our data set is provided by uh, LGTM. Uh, LGTM is a website that uh, continuously monitors uh, thousands, tens of thousands of um, open source projects, so basically GitHub repos, uh, by uh, running queries to look for uh, potential issues in the source code. Uh, this is a wide range of issues. It goes from very simple uh, mistakes like uninitialized variables to um, uh, tent analysis, security vulnerabilities. Um, <coughs> Uh, they're written in QL, which is a query language. If you're interested in the uh, detail, you can look at that reference there. Um, and uh, the queries are open source, so you can uh, uh, also look at them on, uh, on GitHub, so you can see exactly the kind of things that are looked for, and uh, also, uh, uh, if you're keen, uh, how it is expressed using QL. So it's, uh, LGTM supports four languages, uh, and uh, we have thousands of projects for each uh, of this um, um, uh, language. You have the breakdown there. Uh, which are analyzed, uh, and uh, we have alerts which correspond to the QL finds, which can act as quality probe and uh, provides a rich um, code quality data set uh, with metadata. The pre queries contain auto provided metadata, and we have the context, <coughs> such as the language, and size of the project. So the question is uh, how can we leverage this information uh, to um, uh, come up with uh, you know, maybe a useful uh, or a meaningful uh, measure of quality? Well, our approach is, is, is very, very simple, really. It's through the same idea as the one that Albert mentioned, which is to uh, create standards. Uh, and here, instead of having a standard color, we're going to use the open source community that uh, we have uh, uh, analyzed uh, to try to come up with a community-based standard of quality. So to do that, we define metrics, which is essentially an aggregation step of the errors that we have based on the uh, metadata uh, provided by the authors of the queries. Uh, just an example, <coughs> number of different warnings, number of security issues. Um, and uh, for any such metric, we need to then learn the evolution of the uh, distribution of these metric values given project descriptors. So we started very simple, which is uh, language and size of the project, measured in lock. We, we, do, we do plan to uh, expand on that, but first we start with a very simple um, um, uh, set of descriptors. And for um, any metric, this is what the raw data might look like. So each data point here corresponds to a uh, pattern project. X-axis is the size of the project, Y-axis is the uh, value of the uh, metric of interest. That doesn't really tell you much about the evolution of distribution, but if you uh, look at rolling percentiles, I've got the quartiles in there and the 5th and 95th uh, percentile. Uh, you can start some kind of pattern appearing, and you can uh, just simply perform some quantile regression on it. This quantile regression is has a bit of a twist. Uh, there is some monotonicity constra constraints which are enforced, uh, and also we enforce a, a diverging uh, criteria at uh, the edge of our training set, so that we can uh, our training support, so that we can uh, essentially extrapolate uh, the evolution of those uh, quantiles outside of our training data, so we can create a model outside of that. So these are the fits that we get, uh, and we can query those uh, models to answer the question, given a given uh, uh, size, in terms of line of code, what are predicted quartiles for a Python project for this metric? And we can use that to uh, reconstruct the uh, commutative distribution function of uh, these metric values for this particular um, uh, size of project, by again using a very simple model, a piecewise linear function with an exponential asymptote. Um, and it's not quite technically a CDF because we're using a percentile rank definition but it's essentially the idea. And that's, that's it, that's very simple. You can apply that to all your metric, and uh, this is uh, what our pipeline is. We essentially featureize the alerts to create a, um, a row um, um, uh, uh, vectors, which is a metric vector, which is then contextualized using uh, the uh, predicted CDF for each lock, uh, given the locks, which correspond to a, a standards, uh, which encode the standards, which is based on the community open source projects that we, we, we have analyzed with LGTM. And then we, so we have a new uh, a vector that we can then reduce into a final code quality score. 
Uh, this reduction step uh, is just summarizing the information, taking into account the fact that you might want to, um, what you should want to uh, attach more importance to some metric than others. So, for instance, uh, some, some very simple things. Errors are probably some things you want to pay more attention to than warnings, for instance. Um, so it's simply a weighted average, uh, and uh, the, uh, the heuristic about what you want to pay more attention to um, uh, it is, can be turned into this ordinal information, can be uh, transformed into weights uh, using the distribution of the data, using, in this particular case, a very simple uh, probabilistic approach uh, just to define sensible defaults. So what you get at the end is a number between 0 and 1, uh, which is um, essentially a convenient measure of uh, an overall uh, measure of performance with respect to uh, a community-based standard. The closer you are to zero, uh, the closer you are to, uh, underperforming on average everywhere. Uh, and the closer you are to one, the, the, the more, uh, uh, the better you are with respect to the standards. But that's only, not the only way to look at quality. Uh, so here we're answering the first question. You know, how, how is this piece of code performing with respect to expectations, uh, given how we describe it? Uh, you might also be interested in uh, how much better could it be. And uh, these questions are actually not quite the same. And uh, the good news is sometimes that being average is the best that you can be, like literally. Uh, and, uh, and, and just to maybe a slightly contrived example, but uh, to convey the point, if you consider those two projects, you've got a one-liner, a hello world example, and you've got a very big project at PY. Uh, and uh, they both have the same code quality score of 0.5, meaning that they uh, both you know, or exactly what we would expect given their size. In the case of the hello world example, just have zero alerts because the model would not expect you to manage to cram one alert in there. Um, and in the case of the big project, there's n alerts that they, they number and the distribution, the type of alerts they are correspond to what you would expect. So they, they're the same. And the, the answer to the question is, is, is the same in both cases. It makes sense. They perform as expected. However, there's a big difference in the sense that one can improve and the other one cannot. So to capture this, well, we can apply the same logic. We can just kind of contextualize one step further and uh, again apply the same approach to try to predict the uh, CDF of scores given the context that we have for these projects. And we can then put the score in context, get some kind of percentile rank uh, score uh, to, that we can map to grades. And in this case, we would find that the Hello World example, it has, uh, even though it has a score of 0.5, well, you <laughs> will not be able to find a Hello World example that is better than this one because essentially it already has zero alerts, so it has the best possible quality score. So we gave it an A+. Plus. Whereas in the case of the big project, you will find uh, similar projects which actually have slightly fewer or uh, less important alerts, and uh, it might be in the second quartile, so you only get B. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty simple, but uh, it's quite a, a very easy way to get two handles on the, on the quality to answer two questions. Again, how do you uh, um, perform with respect to expectations and what's your room for improvement? Uh, we, could, we plan to improve on that, but first we want to sanity check and make sure that, uh, you know, have some confidence that this is not complete rubbish. Uh, and it's a bit of a tough question to answer because obviously we don't really have an oracle for uh, answering the question of how good is this, is this code. Um, so we have a lot of other proxies uh, which are weak signal for code quality. And uh, the first one we looked at is the uh, GitHub popularity, measuring the number of stars. The intuition here is that the most starred GitHub projects are pro probably not crap. So the idea is that uh, they're more likely to be, they should be, well, we, we think they should be, uh, on average, above standard. Uh, so how do we check that? Well, if we, oops, yeah, if we look at our pattern example, um, here on, the, on this um, uh, graph, we've got the uh, average quality score for all our projects on the, on the y-axis, and on the uh, x-axis, you've got the average number of stars for all the projects, so 0.5 and, I don't know, maybe 100 or so uh, uh, for uh, uh, the so log scale uh, for the stars. And then we're going to look, we're going to ask the same question for the top 1,000 most rated project, the top 500, the top uh, 250, 100, 50, and 10, 25, and 10. And uh, well, we're pretty happy with that pattern here because it's just a sanity check. I'm not claiming that we're proving anything, but it's consistent with uh, the intuition we have. And what's nice is that we do it for Java. We get a similar signal. We do it with JavaScript. We get an even stronger signal um, if you look at the uh, values on the, uh, the y-axis. However, because it's real life, it goes wrong uh, for, uh, for, uh, for C++. So um, uh, we're still pretty happy with what we have. We're investigating that one. There's some, we have ideas of what might have gone wrong here. One thing to point out is that the C uh, languages were the uh, most recently added to LGTM. They're the one for which we have the least data. There could also be a different relationship between popularity on GitHub and the kind of C project. Um, but nevertheless, we, we, we're, not, uh, we're quite happy with uh, this other relationship. Right, so uh, just wrapping it up, wanted to put it uh, together uh, by um, uh, giving you an example of two uh, frameworks that we have analyzed and that 
probably most of you are familiar with, the two Python machine learning framework, Teano and Keras. Um, and uh, what we have here, we apply all the models to them, uh, just based on the uh, GitHub uh, data and the um, uh, our models. So the quality uh, of both these models um, is uh, similar. They're both good. Keras is a bit better. And if we look at all the uh, commits uh, of 2017 and apply the time uh, models that uh, uh, Albert described, we found that uh, the amount of effort, um, the, the amount of coding time, sorry, that seems to have gone in Tiano is uh, quite a lot higher than in Keras. But in terms of output, they seem to be pretty similar. Um, so um, the, uh, we can start defining a notion of efficiency. Uh, and uh, I mean, obviously, we can't say anything with two data points. But this is the kind of uh, relationship that, uh, between you know, efficiency, great, uh, that uh, we're quite curious to, uh, to investigate further. Uh, and it's worth noting that uh, Diano is uh, going to die soon, or, uh, whereas Keras is still around and quite popular. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you. Yes, it's an A. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was, I, was, I was, yeah, so it's, um, I can't show it here, but uh, it's, uh, I was pretty relieved uh, when uh, people asked this internally, and I had no idea what the answer was, and I found it was an A. Uh, and exactly, there was no tweaking, um, so yeah, I was very, very relieved. <laughs> so what should I do to top the ranking of your model? Like, I'm a developer, so what behavior should I follow? So, I mean, I think it's, it's a very broad topic. There's a, lot, there's a lot to be said here. And basically, gaming the system, wh whatever you do, there's, there's, there will no, be ways. I no, but be a good citizen and be rank number one. So, ah. <laughs> so if, you be a, if you want to be a good citizen, we've got tips for you. Um, so um, the thing is that all of this is based on, um, in terms of the quality, is based on uh, alerts, right? So it, it, alerts, the result of the QL, they open source. Uh, LGTM, you can put your project on there. You'll see the kind of alerts you have. It, um, I mean, similar to, I think, uh, the process. So for me, number one, I have to use LGTM. That's like the, the behavior. For free. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so basically, you, you're, to, to, to improve the quality, you need to fix problem in your code. Uh, that's essentially the, the, the meaning of it. And, and the alerts tell you um, um, uh, where you, you can, um, you can uh, improve. And one of the things we want to do is to, uh, um, this is early days, but is to slice this in terms of theme. You know, that, for instance, the maintain, maybe you can have a maintainability category, you know, the usual maintainability, security, reliability, these kind of things. Um, so the uh, question about C++, are those projects order in the way you found very low relationship between the warnings and the stars? Do the C++ projects tend to be older? Do, do they have to be older? They, are they older? Older in terms of... Uh, core-based core older? So in general, I think, um, as, as, as Jean said, we've just only begun to investigate that. But yeah, in general, it seems that um, the uh, C, C++, um, they contain some very old code bases. So that might explain it, because in mm -hmm. older code, the static ones are likely to be unimportant, because they've been there for a while. So who cares? Um, a short answer is that, yeah, yeah. that, that, that could be. And um, yeah, uh, a different age of the code base. This is one of the reasons um, we suspect might play a role. Yeah. Uh, you both study uh, code quality and uh, developers working heavy. Uh, have you uh, reached some conclusions about um, how, to, how developers should allocate their working hours or what kind of programming language they should use to maximize their logical thinking or that kind of stuff? So I think this is um, still very far ahead and um, in particular like, like prescriptive stuff like you should do that. Um, I, I would want to be much more confident before I say anything like that. Um, in fact, um, we are only now starting to put it together in any case, um, and yeah, we would be very interested to look at things like um, if developers program faster, that, that does that mean that the uh, quality of the code base might suffer, or things like that? Yeah, we'd be very interested in that. We have no answers yet. Or conversely, I mean, I think there is this idea that neater, cleaner code allows you to move faster. So as a kind of, if you have this kind of metrics, you can start trying to answer these kind of questions. Yeah. 
So, so just to be clear, we, we're not looking at things using Keras. Uh, which yeah, but is, you know, Keras is just an idea. Keras is the, the lower language. So basically, you're saying um, Keras um, has the easier domain. So no, yeah. no, no wonder it's, it's it's doing better. And yeah, that's, I mean, um, that's a fair point. Have you heard about source cred? Source cred. Source uh, so, uh, sourced uh, Spanish uh, company. It's, it's a recent uh, startup in Silicon Valley which tries to commercialize exactly that, but with bitcoins. With what? Sorry? In that case, they, they must be superior if they have bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, blockchain technology. So, uh, let's meet afterwards. Yeah, yeah, if you're interested. Oh, yes, one question. Uh, So that's a really good question, uh, and it's actually a tricky one to, to answer because um, essentially, um, uh, if you go back in, in, in time, uh, you w it's very costly because you would need to apply the current analysis that you have to um, uh, to uh, well to, to, to back in time. So we continuously monitor things, but if the analysis changes between. Uh, last year and now, we don't have the same comparison basis. So this is one of the tricky questions, how do you kind of uh, track things in a fair way uh, and in a, you know, something which is not overly com uh, costly. Um, so we, we, this is definitely something we, we're interested in to see the evolution of, uh, of the metric versus others. So basically the chat, sorry. Next year, uh, again, on the next year, it was like this. Yeah, and, and in, in, in theory, we would like to have it for last year, but um, the problem is that our uh, measurement instrument is constantly evolving, and um, that needs to be constantly recalibrated, basically. And so so that, that, that data is difficult to get at, not impossible. Yeah, we're working on automating the models to address this question. So, let's thank the speaker again.